Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Alo or Adam L., Tony Glass, and Peter Bohack. New patron, Barry, Yay. joins the family. Barry. Barry. On this episode of DTNS, Meta is building an AI-powered search engine. Apple has officially announced a teeny tiny M4-powered Mac Mini. And Charlotte Henry from the Edition Newsletter is here to talk about how Tubi is killing it in the fast streaming game. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, October 29th, 2024 from Columbus, Ohio. I'm Rob Dunwood. From Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And we have a special guest today, Charlotte Henry from the Edition Newsletter. How are you doing, Charlotte? I'm good, gang. How I'm glad everyone's doing well. It's nice to be back catching up with you. We've got many things to discuss. We do. So let's go ahead and jump into the quick hits. Microsoft has alleged that Google has been conducting covert campaigns in Europe to sway regulators. In a blog post, Microsoft lawyer Rima A. Laley claimed that Google hired the consulting firm DGA Group to assemble the Open Cloud Coalition, a group of European cloud companies tasked with advocating for Google's interests. According to A. Laley, one company declined to join the coalition after learning that it would receive financial support from Google and would be expected to criticize Microsoft's practices in Europe. DGA Group has not yet responded to CNBC's request for comment. Intel has unveiled plans to inject $300 million into expanding its chip packaging and testing facility located in Chengdu, China. The strategic investment aims to bolster packaging capacity and elevate customer support, as confirmed via Intel's China's WeChat account. The company's decision to expand its operations in Chengdu is motivated by escalating competition within that semiconductor industry, particularly in the domain of AI technology. This, tech, uh, this announcement comes on the heels of Intel reporting a net loss of $1.6 billion in the previous quarter. Nigerian fintech company MoneyPoint has successfully raised $110 million in a funding round led by London-based Development Partners International with additional support from Google Africa Investment From. Recognized as one of Africa's fastest growing companies for two consecutive years by the Financial Times, MoneyPoint offers a range of financial services including personal and business bank accounts, collateral free loans for enterprises, and point of sales terminals for small merchants. With the significant investment, CEO Tosin Inyodura plans to solidify money points position in Nigeria while expanding its operations into other African markets. Universal Music Group, or UMG, has joined forces with Clay Vision to develop an ethical framework for AI-generated music. Clay Vision, the company behind the upcoming large uh, music model Clay MM, will collaborate with UMG to re ensure responsible and artist-friendly AI music creation, or so they say. This partnership arrives as UMG is actively engaged in legal battles against AI music generation platforms and also Anthropic. Additionally, back in May, UMG resolved a dispute with TikTok by signing a new licensing agreement that addresses AI-generated music, among other issues. Both those companies seem to be pretty happy with the results. LinkedIn has launched its first AI agent to take on the job role of recruiter. The company describes a new product as a milestone in its AI trajectory. It's LinkedIn's first AI agent, one that happens to be targeting one of the company's most lucrative categories of users. The AI agent is now live with a select group of customers, including AMD, Canva, Siemens, and Zurich Insurance. And a spokesperson said that it will be rolled out to more companies widely in the coming months. So let's talk a little bit about more what's going on in the news. According to a report for the information, Meta is working on an AI-powered search engine to decrease its dependence on Google and Microsoft. The search engine would provide AI-generated search summaries of current events within the Meta AI chatbot. Currently, Meta uses Google and Bing to answer questions about recent news and events. Just last Friday, Meta announced a multi-year deal with Reuters to integrate real-time news content into its AI chatbot. And although this is related, it's a bit different as Meta Meta has been crawling the web for about the last eight months, presumably everywhere that it isn't blocked from doing so, to build a database of information for its chatbot. The company has also been building up a location data uh, database that can compete with Google Maps. So, Charlotte, uh, you know, what do you think? Is AI-powered search, is that, is that a good move for Meta at this point? I think it doesn't have much choice, does it? I mean, this is the way things are going. Look, we've got 
everything you know there's grok isn't there on twitter x there's you know we've seen every day the google stuff gets more and more powerful with its uh you know its ai power search and the summaries we see at the top and all of that so i, I don't think meta has a choice i think it's probably quite scarred mark zuckerberg in particular quite scarred by going all in on the metaverse and that kind of not becoming the such a thing and or not such a thing yet and that it's determined not to be left behind in the ai race it's got to be involved i wonder uh, yeah i've 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 played around with meta's chatbot a little bit mo- mostly in messenger um because that's right. the way that i use facebook the most and not even that much i mean i guess instagram a fair amount but Really, really haven't uh, played around with any sort of a chatbot there. But Rob, before the show, you were mentioning that you spend a lot of time in WhatsApp. I spend probably less time, but I have a few friends who use WhatsApp exclusively. They will not iMessage me ever. Um, And for that reason, I've got now the desktop version of WhatsApp, you know, on all my machines, which Mm -hmm. is extremely convenient uh, because that's kind of where I am during the day. And I'm not always, you know, looking at my phone, looking at notifications on various apps. But I think the idea of staying in there and being able to, you know, add a browser experience with a chat bot, you know, uh, you know, as the plus part of it into something like WhatsApp that's where it gets kind of interesting. Right. So I, I think that what Meta is trying to do is what they've always really tried to do, keep you in their ecosystem for as long as possible. And, you know, just to be frank, they lost the search war that that went to yeah. Google and even to some extent to Bing um, as far as Meta is concerned. But the world is changing. People are starting to use these chat bots to look for things. So, so meta is saying, okay, let's, let's get back in on this and see if we can't take just a bit of share away from, you know, you know, from, you know, our biggest competitor, uh, you know, which is Google. I didn't realize how big the search market is. It's a $287.5 billion uh, business in 2024. So if meta, they don't have to dominate Google. They don't have to even dominate Bing. If they can just get a percentage of people, you know, a small fraction of people using their tool to actually do their search, that could, that could mean hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars for them. And and as importantly, as you said, Sarah, it will keep them in their ecosystem. You you talked about WhatsApp. I do have a lot of friends and family who live overseas. So WhatsApp is the way we all communicate. There are times when people will ask a question and the answer is, why didn't you just search that, you know, on the internet, I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to give you the answer that you could search for yourself. But I always find myself going out of WhatsApp into Google to do the search, get the answer and then go back and copy and paste it into WhatsApp. If I can do that right there within WhatsApp, Meta has accomplished a task of keeping me in their ecosystem, which ultimately means they're going to make more money off of me. And I, I would imagine that there are hundreds of millions, if not mil, if not billions of people who will do the same thing. If it works and it's 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 at least passable, people will try it. Yeah, I think WhatsApp is uh, that's this is the real playground here, you know, of the it's not a WeChat Certainly not yet, but, you know, the idea of the super app, everything being bundled into one app. And I know X is, uh, you know, has its own super app uh, aspirations, but I think all companies want this, right? The idea that you just explained, Rob, is like, if I'm composing an email and I'm trying to be like, "Ah, what's that link? Uh, All right, well, let me, you know, let, uh, let me find the thing and then come back to my email. Maybe I sort of forget about the email or it's just cumbersome. You know, if if all of that can happen in one place, whether you're Google, whether you're Meta, whether you're X, whether you're, uh, you know, Mastodon, they, uh, all of these companies want you to be with them forever. <laughs> they and don't never, want you to bounce out at all. Yeah. They want to be a bit Hotel California, right? You can check out anytime you want. But look, th- th- that's the thing. And these super app aspirations are really what this is all about. But of course... I also think there's another cynical bit to this, and you knew I was going to get cynical at some point, right? <laughs> All of this, you knew it. Don't laugh, Sarah Lane. You knew what I was going. <laughs> I mean, at least but you own it. Let's get cynical. Let's get cynical. I, there's a huge data collection and data mining element to all this that goes both ways, right? You need to mine data to build the AI chatbots. People put stuff in. That gives you more data to mine. It goes both ways, right? And what we know is that Mark Zuckerberg and Meta 
love collecting data one way or the other. That they do. All right. Tell so, me I'm wrong. You, uh, no, you're 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 not wrong. You're not wrong. I think you know. There's so much about. Uh, I feel like in the age of AI, it's like data collection, of course, because they want to feed their own, you know, large language models. It used to be a little bit more like, ooh, they're going to collect th your data and then steal your identity type thing, which is not necessarily untrue, depending <laughs> on the company that you're talking about. But yeah. I think at this point, it's we're all kind of not necessarily okay with it, but getting used to the fact that like, oh, yeah, they, they want your data because they need, they, they need the data for the models or they can't have the models yeah, um, that work. Yeah, well there's two different things right we're getting used to the idea that you look at something on amazon and then you go on a website and see the advert we've kind of all got over that bit which is one of the data tracking things and then of course although i have to say, i'm not sure people have quite got their head around that like people still talk about ai like it's this magic thing that's going to come from nowhere ai only works if we humans put stuff into the models right right yeah yeah. I think I've said this to you on the show before, but I say it every time I talk about AI. Like, you have to put stuff into the models if we're going to get anything out. Anyway. Well, uh, as part of Apple's touted week of Mac-focused announcements, um, and we got a big iMac announcement yesterday, the day that I've been waiting for is here, my friends. Oh, my gosh. Apple announced the M4 Mac Mini line. Big upgrade in general. Supports ray tracing for the first time, shipping with 16 gigs of RAM by default, even for the for the for the base model, although you can go up to 64 gigs in your configuration if you go with the M4 Pro, which will obviously jack up the price quite a bit. I will talk to you about that in a second. But the machine starts at 600 bucks for the regular M4 chip. I say regular M4 chip as like as if that's not a cool thing. I mean, I'm right. I'm running, you know, the, the Intel Mac Mini now, as I believe you are as well, Charlotte. So I mean M4 is like, M1 is a big deal to me. Um, more powerful M, uh, uh, M4 Pro model starts at $1,400. So that's quite a bit higher, but you know, that's where we're starting. Like the refresh iMac that was announced yesterday, the Mac Mini is available to pre order immediately and will be in stores starting November 8th. And I have pre ordered mine. And I am very excited about it, and I cannot wait. It, this is this is my big purchase of the year. You know, you know, you have like the one thing that you're like, I'm just. This is the thing that I'm going to get this year. This was my thing, and I got it. So my my specs. If you're interested, I went with the M4 Pro because why not? You know, come on. Uh, I I didn't go 14 cores. I went 12 core, uh, which is a 16 core GPU. 16 core neural network engine, 24 gigs of unified memory, three Thunderbolt 5 ports. How am I going to use them? Not sure yet. We'll find out. HDMI port, two USB, uh, two USB C ports. There's a headphone jack, which I don't need. I went with one terabyte of solid straight state storage, uh, which is on the lower end. And you might say, gosh, you really don't need any more than that. I really don't. I use so much stuff in the cloud and I've got yeah. external drives. You know, I, I, I could have gone crazy, but like kind of why? And it did jack at the price quite a bit. Um, also, 10 uh, gigabit Ethernet uh, um, capability. What I, what I did think was interesting when I was, you know, so I'm, I, w I came back from a walk with my dog this morning and I saw the news and I was like, yes, Christmas morning. Um, so, you know, I'm going through like, okay, what's my configuration? You know, what do I do? You know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to go too crazy. I, I want the thing that I need, but I also want to kind of future proof myself. I want this to be my machine for years to come. So, so, you know, I went with some, something middle to lower of the road, but if you go through the Mac mini and you go, um, and you choose the M4 pro chip, if you choose the 14 core CPU, 20 core GPU, 16 core neural engine, if you go with 64 gigabytes of memory, if you go with eight terabytes of solid state storage, <laughs> Uh, and then go with 10 gigabit Ethernet, which I did as well. Um, even without pre-installed software, it is going to run you forty-seven hundred dollars US. That's not. Is that what you the one you bought me? Nah, yes. <laughs> well, come on. It was supposed to be a holiday surprise, Charlotte. Jeez. Thanks. You're such yeah. a good friend. I know. I know. Well, cat's out of the bag. Uh, but oh. no, I I, uh, I I did not even pay half of that, um, or no. even really a third of it. Well, but, but this. But, 
But yeah, you, you've got options, but you know, it does get crazy expensive if you want it to get crazy expensive. What I think is most interesting about this is this thing is a tiny little hockey puck. People say, oh, it's like an Apple TV. It's like, it's actually kind of smaller. It's a little bit taller, but it's it's a tiny little computer. I mean, you, wow. you don't even see it. You could just put it in your pocket, really. You know, use it, you know, with, a, with an iPad as the display if you're on the move, you know, and traveling a lot. I mean, there's a lot you can do with something that's this small and powerful. I'm fascinated by this one because I am a big Mac Mini fan. As you said, I have my own one. It's an Intel one. Love it. Had it for a few years. Really, really still love it. It's the show. I, you know, I'm doing the show now with it all set up on there. I think the Mac Mini is a great, great computer. What I always loved about it, though, was I thought it was a really, I wouldn't say cheap because nothing Apple is cheap, but it's like a very reasonably priced entry point to Apple desktop computers. Yeah. and oh, But that seems to have changed now. When you're going through those specs and those prices, that's really changed a lot. There was never a mini that was could cost you the best part of five grand you know well and that was when the mini was first introduced it was introduced exactly for how you're describing it it's exactly apple saying okay you know you're not doing a mac pro you know we're not getting we're not getting too crazy it this is a small lean you know little machine that's going to be good for everyday stuff it is definitely not that the mac mini which is still mini because it's small is a Is it like a powerhouse computer now? Which I is have, extraordinary. I, I have for years always said, oh, I think I might get a Mac this year. And it's never been real because it's just something that I say whenever a new Mac comes out that is not terribly <laughs> expensive. But knowing, and maybe this is part of your excitement in this and hearing you talk about, Sarah, I've been actually thinking about things like, huh, what kind of keyboard's going to work with a Mac and a PC? Will this mouse work with a Mac and a PC? Can I plug this thing into, into all the monitors that I have? I've started to have those conversations because I'm thinking, and I don't want to say the $600 is not an insignificant amount of money because it is, um, but for $600... I can get something that I can run Ecamm Live on. And if that's all that I do, I don't feel like I've lost money. It's like I don't need that Mac to do anything other than run Ecamm Live. So I get 16 gigs of memory and more than enough you know, storage to, you know, to run that one application. I'm like, huh, I, I might have to pick one of these things up. Now, I didn't do like you and do the pre-order, but there very well could be a Mac Mini sitting on my desk sometime around Christmas. Oh. Oh, look at Rob. Well, well, the nice thing about that too is that, yeah, I mean, you're you're just not a Mac guy, you know, on a day to day level. But it, you know, just to have something where you're like, oh, let me test this out. Yeah. You know, there there's so many you know, software programs or you know just a var- variety of platforms that we all talk about where it's like, you know, Mac, PC, iOS, Android, um, and a variety of uh, your mileage may vary type stuff. And I've always found it nice to have just at least one Windows PC, because I'm a Mac person, obviously, uh, but just to have lying around where I can be like, well, let me just see what it's like in that scenario and, and at least have some semblance of, you know, what is different and what might be better or worse. Can I throw something else into here? Yeah. Um, both of you, but I know, Sarah, this is a thing you've focused on, is kind of how confusing that Apple mac lineups have got over the years as it's chucked all different stuff in (laughs) i'm not entirely sure this mac mini helps that because i just go back to my original point of like this was meant to be the cheap you know entry point mac that you said mac desktop you can kind of afford right as rob says 600 dollars pounds is no is not a nothing amount of money but for a mac computer it's pretty good value that's completely gone now but so where does this sit in the lineup in the pricing structure as well. That's a good question. I mean, I, I, and I, you know, as I'm just looking at the drop down menu at apple.com right now, it's like, you know, you got the Find MacBook Air, um, you got the MacBook Pro, you got the iMac, you got the Mac Mini, you got the Mac, well, the Mac Studio is a little bit different. Uh, Mac Pro, obviously, and then a variety of uh, displays. But yeah, I have a friend who uh, has a MacBook Pro that's just sort of long in the tooth. 
and she's going to be, uh, she's nowhere near a, an Apple store where she lives right now, but she's going to be in LA over the weekend. And she was like, will you go to the Apple store and like get a new MacBook pro with me? Just, I just want to like make sure I get the right one. And I was like, yeah. First of all, we could do this online. Uh, but second of all, like, don't you, but you might want an air. I mean, what are you using the pro for? And she was like, I don't know. <laughs> uh, and I, mean, I think I have you get it. You get a lot of folks just kind of being like, I don't know what the best one is for me. I have so many options. Well, folks, I we, we, we could talk about the uh, MacBook uh, mini all day but if you'd like to talk about it more you can join the conversation in our discord which you can join by linking to patreon account at patreon.com forward slash dtns so this is the part of the show i've been waiting to get to welcome to additional conversations uh, tubi has built a sizable audience its numbers surpassed peacock and apple tv and ties with disney plus but the company still isn't profitable yet at nab new york business insiders pete kafka interviewed to ceo and jolly sud about the company's plans to remain competitive in the streaming video tv market so so charlotte can you tell us why does why does Tubi seem to be killing it right now in the game when it comes to yeah these fast TV streaming services. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you about my sexy M2 MacBook Air another time. But for now, let's talk about Tubi because, it, it, I mean, I first of all, I should say I'm a big Pete Kafka fan. So his interviews and conversations with media and tech people are always worth tuning into. But yeah, as you said, he spoke to Anjali Saad, who was laying out, it's just huge success. And I think if you talk to people, no one's really like, oh yeah, when you, they think of streaming, they think of Tubi. But it's making huge huge inroads you know and one thing she really emphasized was how it wants to sort of leverage the fox assets that it has access to and she also said it operates very much with an entrepreneurial spirit and dna uh, i think there's more opportunity we have not yet tapped into to leverage some of those incredible assets that fox has etc 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 we kind of assumed when we were chatting that she means sport but there's obviously a lot of um uh, entertainment brands associated with Fox as well. Stepping back a bit, I really wanted to talk about this because I think fast, you know, those free advertising powered streaming services are becoming a really significant player. Like I've discussed with you guys all the, in various ways, all, you know, when people go, I just can't pay for another subscription. I don't want to spend another eight, nine, ten dollars a month on something else. But suddenly these fast streamers, and um, Tubi is a really great example of this, are, Pluto TV is the other one that springs to mind, right? Mm -hmm. Are mm -hmm. places where you can watch pretty decent content, you know, for quote unquote free. There so are free. adverts. And th Here's the thing for me, Charlotte. If you're born before the mid 80s, you don't really mind watching Tubi, watching Pluto with commercials because that's all we ever did when we were well, when we were younger yeah, it's like, it just you know, like it's, a, it's a really it's yeah. a relative new thing to never have to watch a commercial what did you just but, say sarah i said it's like cable exactly we've gone yeah. completely back to the future well so so you mentioned pluto tv and pluto tv is uh at least you know what when i watch um i've been watching the world series and just various sports like pluto tv is going ham right now on youtube tv advertisements um, and Pluto TV is the whole new Pluto TV thing is like you like reality television, which I do. Well, we've got all the reality shows, you all know, of it. it's, it's all that stuff. And I think their like tagline is like stream now, pay never. And, <laughs> you know, it's like it's like and I, I actually I, I did some um, disclosure. I did some work for Pluto TV back in the day. Um, and, you know, I was sort of like, this is kind of yeah, it's like it's throwbacky. And yes, it, it is ad supported, but bundles, it, free ad supported services. But I mean, so many people are like, that's cool. Well, you know, that works for me. I would assume Tubi is the same way. There, you know, might just be one show that you care about, one sporting event that they happen to be carrying, you know, a, a very, a, a fair amount of reruns where you're like, oh, I like this channel, you know? I mean, how many times have you put on a channel and just been like, eh, just, Show me what you want to show me. I'm making dinner anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's really interesting. Uh, also, uh, in this interview, they mentioned uh, Amazon's Freevee. 
Um, there's obviously also, you know, there's, there's a few different platforms that are doing well on this. Um, there's also the, another fundamental point we kind of have to come to in this conversation, which is that Tubi might have a lot of people watching it, but it's not making money, really. Uh, yeah, which was a problem for all the streamers before and seems to be obviously a problem for these fast uh, platforms now, but maybe maybe we'll get the eyeballs first and uh, make the money at a later point. Yeah, I, I wonder because I actually leave Tubi or Pluto just running as background noise. Um, they're just on. And it, it really does remind me if I go back into like the early 2000s or even back into the 90s, uh, when, when, you know, when, you know, when I was, you know, still a young guy back then, TV, you just turned it on. If there was something you wanted to watch, you would go flip the channels. But I didn't get up and just turn the TV off because I wasn't watching it anymore. It was just kind of just kind of white noise or background noise that was just happening in the background. And I find myself doing that with with Tubi. I find myself doing that with Pluto to where the TV's just on and it's on one of these channels and it's just playing. And like a show comes on, then another show comes on. And it is not uncommon for me to walk past and say, oh, wow, Knight Rider, and just sit down and watch an episode of Knight Rider because it just happened to be on. So um, I, I yeah, am a I, fan I, of these streaming services. Yeah, I tend to have sports as my background things, but yeah, I know what you're getting at. And they're trying to make it a lot easier for you to do this, Rob and Sarah, because one thing they really want is to be in as many places as possible. So we're talking Amazon Fire Sticks. We're talking, I think, YouTube TV. We're talking... They, they just want to be on any platform possible. So that's also another thing to notice that obviously if you're going to not charge a subscription, you've got to make it as easy as possible for people to come and find you. Um, and Sarah, we can discuss the World Series later. I am wearing my New York Yankees t-shirt. <laughs> I mean, best of luck to you, Charlotte, tonight. Where I guess it'd be into the morning to you, uh, for you. Well, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be yeah you know, midnight. We're it's, on it's, a midnight. It's, it's a late, it's a late night watch. Um, yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. The uh, World Series. Yes. Let's do that. Um, but <laughs> before before we do that, let's check out the mailbag. If you are a fan of free in-flight Wi-Fi, and who wouldn't be? Chris Christensen, our amateur traveler, has some very interesting news for you. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. There's something new in the U.S. in domestic airlines and Wi-Fi, and that is free. Hawaiian Airlines offers free transatlantic Wi-Fi on their fleet. JetBlue has long offered free Wi-Fi. Delta now offers free Wi-Fi to all Sky Miles members, which is free to join. And United just last month became the latest U.S. carrier to announce free Wi-Fi rolling out next year using SpaceX Starlink satellite service. American only offers 20 minutes of free Wi-Fi unless you're a T-Mobile customer, in which case you can get it for the whole flight. But the trend is clear. Free Wi-Fi is either here or coming on most U.S. carriers. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. I got to say, I mean, as much as uh, flying is like fairly uncomfortable for all of us, if you give me Wi-Fi, I'm going to complain a lot less. I'm a fan. I um, just want I, it to I, work. I, yeah, just I pay for Wi-Fi on plane, so if I can get it for free, great. Oh, yeah. That is that is wonderful for me. I, yeah. I'm conflicted on this because, in a way, being on a flight is a really nice way to not have to deal with the outside world for X number of hours. And like, I can't connect. Oh, that Charlotte, really nice. that ship that 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 plane has sailed. <laughs> uh, Everyone knows you can yeah. be online now. You're going to be but online if you can. Equally, be <laughs> equally, it does seem kind of dumb that in. 2024 planes can't supply you with wi-fi yeah, like yeah. come on guys i mean i remember so i fly united more than i don't know um other airlines just because you know point system but you know with go go in flight which they use it used to be like you'd get like an hour for 10 bucks or like five hours yeah. for 20 bucks or the duration of your flight for 25 bucks so you'd be like well i'll just get the duration but then it wouldn't work half the time I mean, it was just a mess. Uh, it was just a mess. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks, Chris Christensen, for that, uh, you know, for that mailbag item. And thanks you, thanks to you, Charlotte Henry. Tell the folks where they can get at you. 
Yes, thanks so much. If you enjoyed all our streaming and tech and media crossover conversations, head over to theedition.net. There's a podcast, there's a blog, there's a newsletter. Um, and uh, sometimes Rob Dunwood and Sarah Lane come on the show, so that's nice as well. Um, speaking of fun shows, data scientist and one of our favorite DTNS guests, Andrea Jones Roy, has a new show called Behind the Data. If this sounds familiar to you, the pilot launched during our experiment week, and now it's a standalone show. Very exciting. Season one's eight episodes look at the data sets that help us understand crime, TV, and movies, the state of our health, and the health of democracy around the world. Get the show at BehindTheDataShow.com. You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com forward slash live. We'll be back tomorrow with Scott Johnson. We'll see you Wednesday. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>